Objection. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam President. Um, last January, uh, probably late in the month, I think it was, it occurred to me that as we uh, uh, proceeded in the direction of approaching the statutory limit of our uh, borrowing as a government, that the discussion was becoming a little bit counterproductive in some respects. One in particular was this constant threat that we would default on the loans that we had taken out as a government, the bonds that uh, were held by millions of Americans, and that, uh, that that default would have cataclysmic repercussions. Um, it occurred to me that this is an unproductive discussion, in part because no such default was ever going to happen. Uh, it, certainly, it didn't need to happen. In the event that we didn't raise the debt li limit upon reaching it, or prior to that, we would have enough ongoing tax revenue to cover the debt service by many, many multiples. And so I introduced legislation that would clarify this and would take this risk off the table, try to provide some clarity to markets and to senior citizens who are savers and who have invested their savings in treasuries, and to have a constructive and honest debate about what the implications really are of reaching the debt limit without raising it. So I introduced a bill that would instruct the Treasury Secretary to prioritize debt service in the event that we didn't raise the debt limit upon reaching it. Unfortunately, the idea was dismissed by the administration. It was derided. It was uh, castigated. It was described as reckless and irresponsible and unworkable. This idea of prioritizing the payments that we would make if we didn't raise the debt ceiling was uh, really just dismissed out of hand. Now we have two reports that have come out this week. One uh, cites the, uh, the fact that senior Treasury officials have been calling around to big banks, assuring them that in the event that we don't raise the debt ceiling, which will hit within just a few days, the Treasury is assuring the banks that there will be no default, that they've got this covered, they've taken care of this, the scheduled interest and principal payments on our bonds will occur as scheduled. Well, it's nice that the administration is informing the banks of this. I think it'd be nicer still if they would inform the American public and everybody who has such an important stake in ensuring that the U.S. government not default on its debt. So that was the first report. The second report came out just late last night, and it's been confirmed today. And that is that the Treasury has, in fact, been working on a plan of the very nature that they've been derided, deriding and denying for many months now, that they in fact have been developing and are continuing to refine a plan to prioritize the payments that will be made in the event that the debt limit is not raised by August 2nd. Well, I'm glad they have finally come to this conclusion. Uh, I wish that they had approached Congress and worked with us constructively in the many months ago when I first suggested that we ought to have a plan B, uh, but I'd say it's better late than never. Uh, but now I think that uh, we really ought to get this plan, such as it is, uh, exposed to the, the sunshine of public discourse. We ought to understand what this process will be, and Congress ought to have a role in it. This is why I introduced a, an updated version of this bill last week. I have 33 Senate co-sponsors on the bill, and the purpose of the bill is not to be a substitute for raising the debt limit. I understand that if we don't raise the debt limit, close to August 2nd, uh, they would be, the, the results would be very disruptive. We can minimize that disruption if we have a game plan, and we ought to work this out. The bill that I introduced with a number of colleagues is a bill that identifies three very high priorities, that we ought to make sure we make these payments whether or not we raise the debt ceiling. We know we'll have enough money to do so, and I just think we've got an obligation to do that. The three categories that are embodied in our bill are one, interest on our debt. By making sure we make those payments, we avoid a catastrophic default and we avoid the financial consequences, which could be very dire. So that ought to be pri uh, one of the top priorities. The second, equally important, is making sure that we send out all the Social Security checks in full, on time, to everybody who has one coming. Senior citizens all across America, including my parents, depend on Social Security checks, and they've earned those benefits by virtue of the contributions that they made into that system, in many cases, for many decades. 
The third and final item that I think ought to be prioritized in the event that we don't raise the debt ceiling by August 2nd is salaries, pay to active duty military. I just think the men and women who are risking their lives for all of us deserve to have the peace of mind of knowing that their families back home will not have to wait until Congress gets its act together for them to get their paycheck in arrears. It ought to be, it ought to be done on time. So these three items, if you add them all up and you look at the amount that they would cost during the month of August and you compare that, compare that to the tax revenue that's going to come in the door in August, these three expenses are less than half the amount of tax revenue that's going to come in. So clearly and obviously this is easily manageable or easily affordable, I should say. Technically, the Treasury and the Fed, they've got some work to do, no doubt, to make sure that this is all done smoothly. And this is precisely why they should have engaged with us a long time ago, so that we could have had a constructive period of time to work out whatever details are necessary so that we would have as smooth a functioning process as possible, one that would have the benefit of a transparent debate. I will acknowledge that there might be other items that ought to be added to the list, and we ought to have a debate on this floor and consider those items. What we would end up with is a process that the American people would understand, they would know, they could anticipate, and it would be far more constructive. Now, it's getting late in the day, but maybe it's not too late. And I hope that, uh, that this body will take up my bill and that we'll have that debate, uh, we'll have some kind of resolution, and we'll provide some guidance. I think it is part of our constitutional obligation to have control over the spending that occurs in our government, and this should be no exception. So I would uh, urge my colleagues to, uh, to join in supporting this legislation, and if you have constructive suggestions of how we can make them better, I would welcome them, just as I would welcome working with the Treasury and the administration to make sure that we, in, in the unfortunate event, if it should occur, that we don't raise the debt ceiling by August 2nd, we do everything we can to minimize the disruption that will follow. And I yield the floor. President. Madam President. Senator from Illinois. Madam President, in 1939 we passed a law, and the law created a debt ceiling. Before that law was passed, Whenever the government of the United States of America wanted to borrow money, it had to come to Congress. Congress had to approve it. The President would sign it. We decided then to change it. And instead, we said Congress will approve a certain amount of money that the President can borrow and will change it as needed. In other words, we don't have to approve every single bond issue, every single borrowing of the federal government. 1939, that's what we did. Since then, on 89 different occasions, presidents of the United States have come to Congress and said, the money that you spent, I have to borrow to cover. We don't have enough in the Treasury. 89 different times presidents have come and asked for the authority to borrow money to cover expenses that Congress had approved. 55 times Republican presidents, 34 times Democratic presidents. Not once. Not once did we ever default. Oh, there was a period, I think, in 1979 where there was a few days of technical default, but never any conscious decision by Congress not to fund this debt ceiling and extend it. It is ironic that members of the Senate have come to the floor here and said, I will never vote to extend the debt ceiling as long as I serve in the United States Senate. They're the same members of the Senate who have been voting for and sending to this president requests to spend money. An example, the war in Afghanistan. Some of the most conservative senators on the other side of the aisle not only want us to wage this war, but to stay there and keep spending money. You know what it costs? It costs $10 billion a month for us to protect our troops in Afghanistan. For every dollar that we spend, every dollar that we spend, whether it's on the war, on food stamps, on missiles, on highways, for every dollar we spend, we borrow 40 cents. We shouldn't be borrowing all this money, but we do, because Congress says there are certain things we've got to do as a nation. Many of the same senators who have said to the President of the United States, 
don't withdraw the troops from Afghanistan, keep them there even longer, are now coming to the floor and saying to the president, but we're not going to join in asking for the authority that you need to provide that money for those troops. Now the senator from Pennsylvania has come here the second day and given his take on what would happen if Congress fails to extend the debt ceiling on August 2nd, five days away. August 2nd, what would happen? First, understand this is a self-inflicted wound. We have created this crisis. Eighty-nine times we have extended the debt ceiling without incident. Both parties, both presidents of parties have asked for this over and over again. Who holds the record for extending the debt ceiling the most during his eight-year presidency? Ronald Reagan. Eighteen times, eighteen times, more than twice a year, he asked Congress to extend the debt ceiling because under his eight-year watch, the debt of the United States tripled. Who holds the record the second place on the list of increasing the national debt? President George W. Bush, who came to us, I believe it was seven or nine times, asking to extend the debt ceiling. It's been done by both parties, presidents of both parties. Now, there is this controversy that's raging between the House and the Senate about whether we extend the debt ceiling. It is a vote we've done customarily without this confrontation in the past. Now we face it. But we have created this crisis. It is a self-inflicted wound. And to blame anybody else for it is just plain wrong. History tells us Congress not only has the authority, but I believe has the responsibility to extend the debt ceiling. It is hypocritical to pass bills on the floor of the Senate, to call for the president, to wage a war or build a building, and then not give this president the authority to borrow the money to do it. That's what I'm hearing from the other side. The senator from Pennsylvania comes and says, we can live with this default. We have to figure out how to manage this default. I think he said at one point it could be managed easily. Wrong. Completely wrong. Let me tell you what happens if we default on the national debt for the first time in history. First, what does it do to the reputation of the United States of America? We have a credit report, too. I don't know if you can get a free credit report for the government, but we have one. And we have triple A rating. Pretty good, huh? The best in the world, the strongest economy in the world, and it means that when we borrow money, we borrow it at the lowest interest rate because people trust the United States of America to keep its word. If we borrow money and say we're going to pay it back, we always have done it. We've never defaulted. We're pretty trustworthy as a debtor, and creditors understand that and charge us the lowest interest rates. Now, if this goes through as promised by the Tea Party people, and we default on our national debt for the first time in history, what do you think it's going to do to our credit status? I can tell you what it's going to do. It's going to diminish our credit reputation in the eyes of lenders. What happens when lenders think it's riskier to loan money? They raise interest rates. In other words, the money we borrow to sustain our government will cost us more. How much more? For every 1% increase in interest paid by our government on our debt, it costs us $130 billion a year added to the debt. That's not $130 billion worth of money for education or $130 billion worth of money to protect us from terrorism. That's $130 billion to international bankers and countries that loan us money from this self-inflicted wound. And what else will happen? Sadly, when interest rates on our federal government go up, interest rates go up across our economy. It affects every family, every individual, every business in America. It affects how much you pay on your credit card bill, how much you pay for an automobile loan, a home loan, a student loan. All of these are affected. It is as bad, if not worse, than a tax because it hits everybody. And it couldn't come at a worse time when our economy is struggling to create jobs with millions out of work to think that this unnecessary 
manufactured political crisis, self-inflicted wound is going to hurt our economy and its recovery is just plain wrong. Let me go to the specific point made by the senator from Pennsylvania. Stay tuned and listen to what he just said. He said to us, he has asked our government to tell us how they would manage a default. Who would you pay? Who would you fail to pay? And the government hasn't been forthcoming, the president, with a plan on who will be paid and not paid. Well, we'll get that plan, and we won't like it one bit, and here's why. If we don't extend our debt ceiling in the month of August, here are the raw numbers we have to work with. We will have $172 billion on hand in our Treasury to spend in August, and we will have obligations of $306 billion. So what do you do when you have 55% of what you need? You make choices. The Senator from Pennsylvania said, here are my three choices. First, we pay interest on other debts that we have so we don't default on everything. That's sensible. Secondly, he said, we pay Social Security because these folks, many of them, have no other source of income. That's sensible, too. And then he said, we ought to pay our troops in combat and military. I vote for that, too. These men and women are risking their lives, and they should be our highest priority. And he says, we can talk about the rest. What's the rest? What is the rest? I'll tell you what the rest includes. It includes every Medicare payment to every hospital and doctor in America. It includes every payment to a disabled veteran in America. It includes the decision as to whether or not we are going to fund federal employees. And if they aren't your favorite class of people, I happen to think a lot of them, but many people don't, keep in mind some of the things that they do that we'll have to decide whether or not we should continue doing. I was at the Greenville Federal Correctional Facility two weeks ago. The men and women risking their lives, holding people in prison, thousands of them across the United States. Pay them or not, they weren't on the list. They weren't on the senator from Pennsylvania's list. Just had a meeting where we talked about our weather satellites, collecting information about weather around the world, and warning people when severe weather patterns are developing. And should we pay NOAA to maintain those satellites in orbit or not? As you go through this list, whether you're talking about the FBI fighting terrorism, whether you're talking about the men and women representing the United States in embassies around the world, whether you're talking about law enforcement, whether you're talking about the intelligence agencies of the United States who watch on a minute-by-minute -minute basis the activities of terrorists who would kill us, they weren't on the list from the senator from Pennsylvania. He didn't put those on the list. And if we get down to a choice, and if it becomes that terrible a choice, understand this president, no president, wants to face that. And they don't have to. It is time for us to get this resolved. When I call radio shows back in Illinois, and I'll bet you, Madam President, you get the same thing back in Missouri, people are fed up with what they see going on in Washington here. They cannot believe that grown-ups in the House and Senate paid to do this job are failing, that they're dragging this out. I'll tell you what I got yesterday, an email from a businessman in Chicago. He's a friend. He has a lot of businesses. He's got a lot of people working for him. He had a closing yesterday on a deal worth more than $100 million to renovate a major building in Chicago. It would have been a lot of jobs. It would have been great for our city. The closing was canceled. The parties at the table said, until Congress gets this figured out, we're not going to close this deal. He sent me an email and said, for God's sake, when is this going to come to an end? And I'm hearing that all over from people who are just fed up with it. Chicago Tribune printed an article today entitled, Across the State Businesses Fret Over Debt Ceiling Showdown. And they went through a long list of individuals that talked about what this stalemate might mean. Ed Weimer with Wind Trust Financial Corporation worried that a prolonged stalemate could lead to a double dip recession, even more unemployment. He went on to say, the possibility of not getting a Social Security or other government check will make people skittish. 
That would weaken consumer spending and hamper economic growth. Higher interest rates, he said, would hit an already stressed real estate market. A banker in Lake Forest said, could you imagine if we ran our business like that, referring to what's going on here in Washington? These are the people who make the regulations we have to live with. The Illinois Hospital Association figures that its members will have to absorb $8 billion in federal payment reductions over 10 years as a result of the 2010 Health Care Overhaul Act. Now they're bracing for another blow. We're concerned that any additional cuts to hospitals, whether through Medicare, Medicaid, will have a dramatic impact on hospitals and health care providers. The Illinois Finance Authority, all of these groups look at this situation and say this makes our economy even worse. It is a self-inflicted, politically manufactured problem. It is a crisis which does not have to exist. Should we ignore our debt? Of course not. Madam President, you know that I've worked on this issue for a year and a half now with more specificity than ever in my career. I was on the deficit commission the President appointed, then I stuck around afterwards as six senators, a group of six we called ourselves, wasn't a very inspired name, but that's what it came up with, three Democrats and three Republicans, and we sat down for six months and hammered out an agreement among us to reduce our federal deficit by $4 trillion over the next 10 years with a balanced approach that puts everything on the table. Everything. Revenue, entitlement, spending, everything. We came to an agreement. We presented our agreement to the senators just two weeks ago. Forty-nine senators showed up at that meeting, Democrats and Republicans. It was amazing. And then we followed up and said, are you ready to put your name on the bottom line? Will you support moving forward with this bipartisan way to deal with the deficit in a responsible way that doesn't endanger our economy and make us face bankruptcy as a nation? We now have 36 senators, Democrats and Republicans, who signed up. That's a pretty good number. It shows that this just isn't an idea that we came up with that doesn't have legs. Sure, we're going to have to change it. We understand that. But look what happened here. Democrats and Republicans sat down, no cameras, no reporters, and worked out a reasonable way to deal with the deficit and our nation's debt. What's better? Lurching from this crisis to another crisis four months from now, as Speaker Boehner suggests, or dealing with this in an honest, bipartisan way today? Madam President, I can tell you what the American people want us to do. At least I think I know what they want us to do. They don't want us to endanger this economic recovery. They don't want us to kill jobs. They don't want us to hurt businesses. They want us to help this economy recover and create, create jobs. They want us to extend this debt ceiling so that we don't see interest rates going up across America at exactly the wrong time. They certainly don't want to see us put in a position where we have to decide between paying Social Security recipients and our soldiers who are in combat. That's what the administration would face if this crisis that has been manufactured on Capitol Hill continues. What they expect us to do is to earn our pay as members of the House and Senate, to work hard to come up with a reasonable approach, and to be willing to give a little. It's the only way you reach a compromise. Compromise is the nature of this political process. And those who condemn it, and there are some who do, say never give up, stick to your principles, never change, we're not going to get a solution. We've got to be willing to work together to give and get this done. Now here's what I predict is going to happen soon. I predict that predict Speaker Boehner is going to call his bill on the floor of the House. We have told him in advance it is a non-starter here. And if it passes the House, it will come here and will likely be voted down. We will then propose an alternative. Majority Leader Harry Reid has an alternative which basically extends the debt ceiling beyond next year so our economy has a time to recover. It cuts spending by over $2 trillion so that we address our deficit. And it does it with a list of spending cuts that every Republican has voted for. So it's not controversial in substance. I think that's the best approach. He creates a joint committee to deal with the long-term deficit, and I've been involved in those, and I think we should. And I think it's a good, balanced approach that solves our problem, gets us through this crisis. 
We're likely to vote on it either tomorrow or the next day. But we're down to five days. We're running out of time. We have got to get this done. And I want to just tell you, any senator who comes to the floor and says defaulting on our debt and reaching the first point in our history where the credit reputation of the United States is in doubt is okay, it's a good political tactic, they don't understand the gravity of that decision and the impact it will have on businesses and families for generations to come. And this notion that we can pick and choose the checks we're going to send out in August when we're going to have 55 or 60 percent of what we need is going to put us in an impossible position, deciding among all the valuable, important functions of government which ones will not be funded. That's an impossible position for this president to be in. We can't do that to him. We can't do this to our government. We can't do this to our country. I hope that after the House votes today or tonight, whenever it may be, that we take up the measure quickly. Let's move this forward. Let's get this done. Let's avoid this crisis. Let's meet the responsibility we were elected to face. Madam President, I yield the floor and suggest the absence. Clerk will call the roll. Mr. Akaka.
that be dispensed with? Without objection, so ordered. And also understand that uh, we're in morning business and senators are allowed to speak for up to 10 minutes. That's correct. I will take less than that, Madam President, but thank you thank for you. recognizing me. Our greatest Republican president, Abraham Lincoln, in his drive to end slavery said, a house divided against itself cannot stand. With these few words, Lincoln is calling to us through the echoing halls of history. He is calling for us to put aside our differences and to become unified into one people, one nation, one common purpose. Mr. Lincoln recognized that the issue of slavery was tearing this great nation apart and that it could not survive half slave and half free. Slavery was the great unfinished business of our founders. The institution of slavery was so ingrained in the infant country's past and future that even Washington, Adams, Jefferson, Madison, and Franklin could not disentangle it. Madam President, I'm not trying to equate carrying too much debt to slavery. Please understand that. But the truth remains. A house divided against itself cannot stand. This house, this nation, this republic, is divided against itself. Our founders called their effort to establish a new nation a great experiment, and it has been. Nothing like it had ever been tried, and America has been an unequaled success in all of world history. Truly, we're the envy of the world. We began at 13 weak and barely United States, but quickly became the strongest country in the Western Hemisphere. About 70 years after we adopted the Constitution, we survived a deadly civil war. American influence grew as we became the agent of democracy and capitalism for the entire world. Although our military power was slow to develop, we fought on the winning side of two world wars and grew into an economic, military, and cultural superpower. We're a nation of immigrants, of many faiths, of many races, and our national call to union is e pluribus unum. Out of many one. Out of many stay out of many states is forged one nation. Out of many races is forged one people. Out of many one. The founding fathers had to balance the agrarian interests of the South and the West with the industrial and shipping interests of the North and the East. They balanced small states and big states. They balanced regions dominated by the frontier with regions dominated by the old world. They balanced Catholicism and Protestantism and Judaism. They balanced English culture with German culture with French culture. Out of many, one. Had previous generations of leaders not achieved oneness, we would not be, could not be, the great nation we are today. The Senate was added to the Constitution as a compromise. Washington, D.C. was placed on the banks of the Potomac as a compromise. States were added to the Union as a result of compromise. In this sense, America's ability to find compromise has always been our pathway to greatness. Our founders established this more perfect Union with a clear-eyed knowledge that came from experience that a house divided against itself cannot stand. Division leads to failure. To make our democracy work, we all must work together. We must acknowledge that we have differences of opinion and differing points of view, but we must commit to unity. The floor of the United States Senate is the marketplace for ideas, and it is a window into democracy that is a living testimony to the greatness and diversity of our nation. The floor of the United States Senate should not be a graveyard for ideas or innovation or promise. Campaigns should stop at the threshold of this chamber. What happens in this chamber is much greater than any single senator's political fortunes, and it is much more important than a political party's fate at the next general election. We have a sacred responsibility to the people through the Constitution and if we orient ourselves to the next presidential election, we're failing in our duty. 
The United States Senate at its core, by its nature, is where decisions get made. We have our ideological battles here, that is certain. But this is where consensus should be achieved. The Senate should fuel the engine that propels us to a better future, not stall that engine. All Americans should fully participate in our government. We should register to vote and serve on the jury. We must volunteer in the schools and pay our taxes. We must teach our children about our country, their country, and prepare them for their time to lead. We must tell them that our system of government is the best that man ever devised and that it works. It works very well if we allow it to work. This moment in history is a day where we can show our children, as well as our founding fathers, that this is no longer a house divided. We can show the world that our parents instilled in us the value of e pluribus unum. America's best days lay ahead, and if we are mutually committed to the future, it is, however, not possible unless we set aside our differences and work together for that common goal. My fellow senators, please heed the words of Abraham Lincoln and understand that there is truth in what he said. A house divided against itself cannot stand. Madam President, I yield the floor. Madam President. The senator from New Mexico is recognized. I thank uh, the president. Let me uh, speak for just a few minutes about the disappointment I have, and I'm sure many other colleagues have, with the situation we find ourselves in with respect to the partial shutdown of the Federal Aviation Administration. My colleague from Colorado, Senator Bennett, was on the Senate floor this afternoon and spoke eloquently about how this, this partial shutdown is affecting his state of Colorado, and I wanted to just talk briefly about the similar concerns I've got for my state of New Mexico. Frankly, some in this Congress, in my view, have lost sight of what they, are, they were elected to do here in Washington. Aviation is a critical piece of our transportation infrastructure, a critical piece, part of our economy, and yet for nearly a week now, the Congress has failed to extend the necessary authorizations to keep the Federal Aviation Administration doing the work that needs to be done. It's been over five months since the Senate passed its reauthorization bill for aviation programs. That vote was overwhelming. It was 87 to 8. So this was not a partisan bill. This was a bill supported strongly by Democrats and by Republicans. The bill included a number of programs important to my state of New Mexico and to the entire nation, including the Airport Improvement Program that provides grants for construction of runways, taxiways, that help to make airports safer. These projects also create hundreds of jobs in the construction industry in my state and thousands, tens of thousands of jobs in the construction industry nationwide. In my view, one of the most important features of the Senate's bill relates to our air traffic control system. Our current system is universally recognized as being antiquated, inefficient, and increasingly it is recognized as being unsafe. The bill that we passed out of the Senate dramatically accelerates the FAA's efforts to convert the air traffic control system to one that's based on satellites and, and global positioning systems, similar to the GPS that many of us have in cars. When implemented, NextGen, which is the, the name that's been given to this improvement of the air traffic control system, NextGen will improve safety, will increase the efficiency of operations, will reduce delays, will save fuel, and will help to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. So thanks to the good work that Chairman Rockefeller and Ranking Member Hutchison 
In the Commerce Committee did, the Senate passed a good bill to reauthorize aviation programs. That was in February. Then in April, the House passed its own version, nearly on a party-line vote. The House majority, unfortunately, chose to include partisan and divisive provisions in that legislation that were not appropriate in an aviation bill. Let me just uh, give a little description of what that, those partisan and divisive provisions I'm referring to are. There was an uh, editorial in the New York Times this morning that summed it up pretty well. It says, last year the National Mediation Board changed a rule to make it easier for airline and railroad workers to unionize. Until then, workers who did not vote in union representation elections were counted as no votes. After the change, this is the change by the National Mediation Board and its own rules, those, those individuals who did not vote were counted as absentees. Pushed by the airline lobby, House Republicans passed a long-term FAA reauthorization in April that would have undone the rule change. The Senate reauthorization bill passed in February maintained the rule and left the issue alone. In spite of this difference in the two bills, Senate did appoint conferees, uh, did begin working to resolve differences, uh, as we should have. And working out the required compromise is never easy. Uh, unfortunately, now the House has decided that in order to gain leverage over the Senate to accept the House anti-union provisions, that there would not be any additional clean extensions of existing law. We have had 20 extensions of existing law to just keep the Federal Aviation Administration operating while the House and Senate negotiate the final resolution of this larger bill. So unfortunately, the situation now is that the Congress's failure <clears throat> to extend the authorization one more time has shut down important aviation programs across the country. 4,000 FAA employees have been furloughed, forced to go without pay. Across the nation, important airport improvement projects are now on hold. In my state of New Mexico, $26 million in funding for over two dozen projects has been stopped. These include a new fire truck for the airport in Roswell, runway projects in Raton and Santa Rosa, <clears throat> snow removal equipment in Clayton and Vaughan, in Santa Fe, work on a vital new radar system has been stopped. And in Albuquerque, progress has stopped on a $10 million project to replace the airport parking apron. What's particularly troubling to me is that the authority to collect the ticket tax has also been suspended. And why should this matter? Well, this is the money that goes into the airport trust fund and allows us to continue to make improvements and maintain our airport infrastructure around the country. This is funding that is used to pay for safety and infrastructure projects at airports in my state and everywhere in the country, as I understand it, it amounts to about $30 million a day that's being lost from that trust fund at a time when we are being told that the country's falling behind in its investments in basic infrastructure. This lost funding is clearly going to have major impacts on airport projects down the road. People also need to realize that the fact that the FAA is no longer able to collect the ticket tax does not mean that people don't have to pay the full price that they would be paying if the tax were being charged. The airlines, with very few exceptions, have announced that they're going to continue to charge the full price for tickets and just pocket the extra money themselves instead of turning it over for infrastructure projects at our airports. So here we are. It's simply, in my view, unacceptable for the Congress not to restore to the FAA the authority to collect airline ticket taxes and to resume normal operations. Senator Rockefeller has introduced a clean extension 
of the aviation programs, whatever differences there are between the two bodies in provisions in the short-term extension are trivial compared to this $30 million a day that the nation is losing in funding for our nation's airport projects. We are all here in the Senate and in the Congress and, and really in the country focused on the need to extend the debt limit. And this is the most urgent need we face. But in addition to that, we need to restore to the FAA the authority to resume its normal operations and to resume payment into the air, payments into the airport trust fund. To leave for an August break without having fixed this FAA uh, lack of authorization problem as well uh, would be uh, seriously irresponsible. Uh, Madam President, let me ask unanimous consent that the editorial in this morning's New York Times entitled, This is Called Small Government, uh, be included in the, in the record following my remarks. With that objection, so ordered. Madam President, I yield the floor. Thank you. The Senator from Wyoming is recognized. Uh, thank you, Madam President. Madam President, uh, I follow my colleague who talked about our need to prevent default. The need that we have and why we are here and why there will be a vote in the House tonight and uh, a vote in the Senate as well, and it has to do with the need of our nation to prevent default. And also, of course, the need to cut spending. Our problem is that we spend too much. Americans all around the country are calling in to members of the House and the Senate and saying, hey, let's, let's kind of get things under control and let us cut the spending. Now, my friends on the other side of the aisle, I'm happy to see with the proposals being brought forth are beginning to understand what my constituents from Wyoming have known from the very beginning. Americans are not taxed too little. Washington spends too much. Now, the president seems to be more concerned about the next election than about the next generation of Americans. And I, I, I was just astonished uh, last week when the president uh, was, was addressing the nation, and he talked about what his bottom line was in this whole debate and the whole discussion. He said, and I quote, he said, the only bottom line, this is the president of the United States saying, the only bottom line I have is that we have to extend this debt ceiling through the next election. So the President of the United States, the only bottom line I have is that we have to extend this debt ceiling through the next election into 2013. Well, Madam President, since 1962, the debt ceiling has been raised 74 times. Uh, on average, the debt ceiling is raised on an average about every eight months. But now the President, folks on the other side, are calling for the largest debt ceiling increase in history and it's designed to last a lot longer than just eight months, almost for a year and a half as the president wants to go into 2013, and specifically, as he said, through the next election. His Treasury Secretary has essentially said the same thing when he said, quote, we have to lift this threat of default from the economy for, he said, you know, for the next 18 months. He said, through the election. Well, if the President and the Secretary get their way, they will be able to ignore the single biggest threat to our national security until after the next election. And the national security is it a threat, as the uh, Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff said, the greatest threat to our national security is the debt. You know, the President could have gotten what he wanted last week, which is an increase in the debt ceiling beyond the election when the House passed cut, cap, and balance. I was one of the original co-sponsors in the Senate, in favor of it, support it, and continue to support it. Instead, the President issued a veto threat, told Democrats in the Senate to kill it. After all, they're still the majority party. Well, now the Senate Democrats, I believe tonight, will have the power to save our country's finances once again. And they can do that by passing the Boehner Plan pass it through this body and send it to the President's desk for him to sign. Instead, the Majority Leader has said no Democrat, not one, will support this plan. 
That's what the president wants, raises the debt ceiling. Let's us as a nation avoid default. But no, it doesn't take it beyond the election. So, you know, it's, it's interesting. It, it, would, it would seem that support by the, the Democrats for this plan would clearly signal their desire to continue working to rein in Washington's wasteful spending, to get our fiscal house in order. Doesn't seem to be the, the signal that the president wants to send. The Boehner plan is the only plan currently on the table that can get through the House of Representatives and protect us from default. Republicans have put forward plan after plan. Democrats, the White House, have done nothing but criticize from the sidelines. The, the, the White House press secretary has even said that, quote, leadership is not proposing a plan for the sake of having it voted up or down and likely voted down. That's what he said. He said, now that the Democrats have even sent a letter asking for a long-term debt increase. But, but how can we have a long-term debt increase if, if no plan to get to? You know, the White House press secretary claimed recently that the president's plan is well known. This is what he said today. He said, there is no plan that has been offered certainly in the last several months about which more detail is known. I say, where are the details? I'd like to know how I could get this well-known plan and share it with my constituents back home in Wyoming. Um, how did the, the CBO score this plan that, according to the president's press secretary, is a plan that, uh, in which there has been uh, so much detail known? Where is it? What's the CBO score? Where's the text of it? How can we actually read it? How can we bring it here and discuss it and debate it? Well, these things don't exist, either a CBO score or a text, because the White House has continually refused to release a plan, even with pleas coming from Congress and from the media. Now, I can understand why the President may be reluctant since the time he last brought uh, a, a budget uh, to this body, it was defeated 97 to nothing. Not one Democrat voted in support of what the President had proposed. Not one. No one supported the President's budget plan. The, um, there is a, uh, a Reed plan being proposed, and according to the Congressional Budget Office, the Reed plan cuts about $2.2 trillion from our budget over the next 10 years. But if you dig a little deeper, you find that these so-called cuts are really accounting gimmicks. The House Budget Committee looked at the Reed plan, and their assessment was not very flattering. And I'll quote, Reed's plan relies on the inaccurate assumption, the inaccurate assumption that surge level spending in Iraq and Afghanistan is scheduled to continue over the next decade. No one in America, and I would hope no one in the White House, believes that surge level spending in Iraq and Afghanistan is scheduled to continue over the next decade. But the plan endorsed by the President of the United States relies on such an inaccurate assumption. Why is he trying to mislead the American people? Well, the Democrats are claiming to save money by cutting spending that was never, ever going to be spent in the first place. And this is the strongest possible proof that the White House is not realistically dealing with the situation and does not, in my opinion, to be serious about really and reliably cutting the debt. In fact, even if you assume that the Reed plan would work, it wouldn't cut spending fast enough to keep up with the spending that the President is doing. The President wants to borrow at least $2.4 trillion to get him through the election, to get him into 2013. But the last draft of the floor plan that we're going to be asked to discuss cuts $2.2 trillion over 10 years while raising the debt ceiling by $2.7 trillion. It would take over a decade to pay back what this president wants to borrow over just the next year and a half. So we're still borrowing at a much higher rate than we are cutting. This is not responsible leadership. Responsible leadership, Madam President, would be to recognize the solution to our country's financial woes. That solution is to avoid default while consistently cutting spending and balancing our books the way that families do. That solution would require us to keep working until we get it right. Now, this is the theory at the heart of Speaker Boehner's plan. The President